Pope John Paul II Cultural Center in Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. Welcome to the show. And welcome to you. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the World Over Live. This is a fantastic show we have for you. We hope you're having a wonderful advent. All year, we have not had a reaction to an interview like the one that greeted Dr. Jenny Stepanek's appearance on the program. She joined us not long ago to talk about her late son, Maddie, who was a poet, an author, and a tireless advocate for peace, and all that before the age of 14. Tonight, Jenny joins us live in studio to take your calls. She'll be discussing dealing with hardship and loss during the holidays and talk about the faith that sustained her and Maddie even in the darkest times. She's an incredible person, and it is an interview you will not want to miss. We'd love to include you in tonight's program, so give us a ring. 1-800-221-9460 in the U.S. and internationally. 205-271-2980, or drop us an email, worldover at EWTN.com. So let's begin. Here's the brief. News from the world over this week. With Christmas just over a week away, Iraqi authorities have obtained confessions from captured insurgents who say al-Qaeda is planning attacks in the U.S. and Europe over the Christmas season. Iraqi officials have called the claims a critical threat. They did not specify which country or countries in Europe are alleged targets, but noted that last weekend's botched bombing in Stockholm by an Iraqi-born Swede were among the alleged plots. On Wednesday, the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security alerted all local law enforcement agencies to be on the alert for potential terrorist threats during the holiday season. Also in Iraq, concrete walls up to 10 feet high are being erected around churches in Baghdad and Mosul in order to protect Christmas churchgoers from violence. The barriers are the Iraqi government's response to reports of increased threats to churches and other Christian communities ahead of Christmas. But in light of the recent wave of attacks there, church leaders have urged the faithful to scale back public activities to reduce the security threat. Police with screening equipment will control access to the churches in an attempt to deter would-be terrorists. And a gun battle between rival gangs in Mexico this past weekend killed 11 people during a Virgin of Guadalupe celebration. Another 30 people were injured. Cardinal Juan Sandoval Iñones of Guadalajara expressed indignation over the shootings and called on drug cartels to respect the holiday season. Cartel violence has become so bad, Cardinal Sandoval urged the faithful to take extreme measures to protect themselves and not leave home unless absolutely necessary. He also warned them to avoid becoming victims of extortion by not giving out personal information over the phone. The cardinal said Mexico is suffering because the faithful, quote, have not seriously accepted the message of Our Lady. Mexico's bloody drug war has claimed more than 28,000 lives since President Felipe Calderón intensified a crackdown on cartels in 2006. In a statement released Thursday, Pope Benedict XVI has again called attention to the persecution of Christians. The comments were central to his message for the World Day of Peace on January 1st. The Holy Father alluded to a recently released report identifying Christians as the most persecuted religious group in the world. He called it unacceptable that some Christians have to risk their lives just to practice their faith. Pope Benedict's strongest comments, however, were directed at the secular West. He expressed his hope that in the West, and especially Europe, quote, there will be an end to hostility and prejudice against Christians because they are resolved to orient their lives in a way consistent with the values and principles expressed in the gospel, end quote. And as embryonic 
stem cell research remains in a legal limbo here in the U.S., another remarkable adult stem cell breakthrough was announced in Germany this week. Doctors there have declared an HIV patient cured of the disease. In 2007, the patient, who was suffering from both leukemia and HIV AIDS, was given a bone marrow transplant to treat the leukemia. According to the doctors, stem cells from the bone marrow came from a donor who had a natural resistance to the HIV infection. As early as 2008, the patient had a fully functioning immune system with no signs of HIV AIDS, as his blood cells became genetically identical to those of the donor. Subsequent tests indicated no signs of HIV AIDS returning. So his doctors this week declared him cured. Another amazing advance in adult stem cell research. And a major court ruling was announced in Europe on Thursday. The Strasbourg French-based European Court of Human Rights backed the abortion right of a woman in Ireland, Ireland who was in remission from cancer but still felt her pregnancy endangered her life. It ordered Ireland to pay the woman $20,000 in damages as she chose to travel to Great Britain for the abortion. The case dates to 2005, when the woman and two others, backed by the Irish Family Planning Association, sued Ireland for the right to abort. Irish pro-life advocates are decrying the decision as an unwarranted attempt to coerce the Irish people to overturn their ban on abortion. And back here in the U.S., a Catholic hospital is on the verge of having its status as a Catholic institution revoked. St. Joseph's Hospital and Medical Center in Phoenix has come under fire by its bishop, Thomas Olmsted, for an abortion performed at the hospital in 2009. In a letter last month, Bishop Olmsted told the president of the hospital's parent company, Catholic Healthcare West, that the facility must recognize that the 2009 abortion violated the U.S. bishop's ethical directives and pledge that it will never, and it will never occur again. The mother of the aborted child suffered from pregnancy-induced hypertension. The condition can be fatal if not treated. Instead of treating the condition, the Hospital Ethics Committee deemed the 2009 killing of the unborn child necessary to save the life of the mother. On Wednesday, the hospital issued a statement that read, We believe that all life is sacred. In this case, we saved the only life we could save, which was the mother's. End quote. Talks between the hospital and Bishop Olmsted are ongoing. And the little town of Bethlehem lit their Christmas tree on Wednesday. But the town's mayor used the occasion to protest Israel's restrictions on access to the West Bank town. These restrictions, he says, are weighing heavily on holiday cheer. Mayor Victor Batarse noted that this is a time for peace and goodwill, but travel restrictions have damaged the 2,000-year relationship between Bethlehem and its twin city, Jerusalem. Bethlehem is a minority Christian town, about two-thirds of which is Muslim. Israel's military says it's been working with Christian leaders to coordinate motorcades into Bethlehem for Christmas Eve midnight mass. And a recent forest fire, or recent forest fires rather, in Israel have uh, left a shortage of Christmas trees this year, but that didn't stop the northern Israeli city of Haifa from putting one up, as they always do, in the city center. The municipality commissioned a local industrial designer to build a Christmas tree made of more than 5,000 plastic soda bottles. The designer collected more than 6,000 bottles from around the city, rejecting around 1,000 or so because he wanted them to be advertisement-free. And where can you find the most expensive tree in the world? How about the United Arab Emirates? The Emirates Palace Hotel has erected a 40-foot faux fir tree extravagantly adorned with 131 ornaments of gold and precious stones. The value of the tree? Around $11 million, shattering a 2002 record set in Japan by only $200,000. 
Somehow I think they've missed the point of Christmas, but we'll get to that later. If you're planning a trip to D.C., why not attend the World Over Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern? Drop us an email at worldoverdc at yahoo.com, and we'll put your name on our guest list. When we return, Dr. Jenny Stepanek is here live to talk about how she dealt with the loss of her four children and the faith that sustains her today. A real World Over inspiring interview when we continue. Stay with us. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. There is no doubt that Christmas is a season of light, but like the first Christmas, that light comes amid great darkness, even suffering. For many, the holidays can be a difficult time due to illness or personal loss. I know some friends who buried parents just this week. So this Christmas, I thought it appropriate to bring back one of the most inspirational interviews of the past year. Jenny Stepanek is the mother of Maddie Stepanek. He was a prolific poet, a peace advocate, and philosopher who succumbed to a rare form of muscular dystrophy before his 14th birthday. He captured the hearts of media figures and the public alike. Oprah Winfrey, Larry King, President Jimmy Carter, and countless others were touched by the purity of his message and the faith that informed it. Tonight, Jenny joins us to share Maddie's message and her own courageous battle with the disease that claimed the lives of four of her children. She is author of the new book, Messenger, the legacy of Maddie J.T. Stepanek and Heart Songs. Please welcome back to the program live another messenger, Dr. Jenny Stepanek. Jenny, thanks so Thank much for being back. back. Right. Great to see you in your you. Christmas finery. Yes. I want to start, and I'm going to put the number up first for you guys at home. If you'd like to give us a ring, if you'd like to be part of the show, and we want you to, if you have a question for Jenny, if you're going through difficulty this, this season, uh, coping with the loss of a loved one or battling your own uh, illness, give us a call, 1-800-221-9460 in the U.S. or internationally, 205-271-2980 or drop us an email, worldover at ewtn.com. Jenny, I want to start at the beginning. Two of your children had already succumbed to this very rare form of muscular dystrophy. When you are pregnant with Maddie, your little boy, Jamie, is suffering and, and in the process of dying from this terrible disease at that moment. W what did the doctors, what did your friends advise you at that point when you said, I'm pregnant with another child? I think the most common phrase that I heard was, I'm sorry. And everyone assumed I would get an abortion um, and not carry the child through to, to birth. Mm -hmm. um, I cried when I found out I was pregnant with Maddie, not because I didn't want him, but because I knew what the future probably held for him. Mm -hmm. um, but it never even crossed my mind that I would not keep this child. Mm -hmm. um, I was told by one priest, you don't know God's reason for everything, mm -hmm. but for some reason this child is a gift. And whether you have that gift for one second or one century, mm -hmm. your job is to find meaning in the gift. Mm -hmm. And, and what that's a gift, what I did. What a gift he, he is oh, and yes. was. Yes. Uh, it, it continues on. And I want to get into some of that in a moment. When he, his brother Jamie died, uh, when he was a small child, yeah. three years old, right? Before he turned three. He turned it before yeah. he turned three. Yes. And then he started acting out in school subsequently yes. as a result of the ongoing mourning, right. I guess. Of it. What did you suggest? How did you deal with, you've just buried three children, Jenny, and I have to tell you, reading the book again, uh, I am I am breathless just trying to get through the first chapters because I can't imagine. I don't think anyone who hasn't experienced it can imagine. The pain and the confusion, spiritually, you must be in at this point. Yes, there is nothing heavier than an empty lap. And losing any loved one is hard, but burying your own children um, is burying a part of yourself while you're still alive. Mm -hmm. um, when Jamie first died, uh, Maddie was a little over two and a half, and it was recommended that I just not mention Jamie, just move on, and Maddie's grief mm -hmm. would be quick, and he'd forget his brother. Mm -hmm. 
And as you mentioned, it was clear that that didn't happen. Maddie remembered and got very confused. Why aren't we talking about Jamie? And mm -hmm. we put his brother in a little white box and buried it. I mean, mm -hmm. that was terrifying. And mm -hmm. this is a child with some of the same medical equipment. Um, so I really decided to change what had been advised to do for Maddie and talk directly with him. About um, his brother. About his brother, you know. Um, and I sat down with Maddie and asked him questions. What do you remember? Tell me about your brother. Tell me about his nurses. Tell me about his equipment. What do you, what made him smile? What made him cry? When did he die? Um, and now what makes you smile? What makes you cry? And I helped him articulate what his experience was so that he'd know it's okay to be sad. It's okay to be angry. And you helped him assemble a little book, right? Yeah, a little book, very first book, uh, the story of a very special brother. Huh. But the book also let him know that despite sadness and pain, you can also be happy again. Mm -hmm. And that book was really a launching point. Maddie went and started writing his own books. He started talking into a tape recorder and mm -hmm. creating stories and poems for his stuffed animals who were dealing with the loss of a brother stuffed animal that was also dying. Um, it, his poetry really began through playing and mm. working through his grief. You, you tell the story in the book that when he was four years old, He's playing with his Legos. He falls to his knees. Yes. And then he looks up yes. and he starts reciting this poem. Yes. Tell me about that poem and that moment for you. I had seen him stop playing and get down on his knees in a prayer posture. Like he was receiving some message? Yes. I had seen him do that before, but I thought, well, you know, perhaps he's seen this someplace else and he's reenacting because he loved playing. Mm -hmm. But this particular time, he was four and a half years old, and he stayed in that position for five, ten minutes. And, you know, he said, when he was done, he said, could you please write this down, because it's quicker than I can write. Um, and I've worked very hard to shape the message in my heart. The, God put a message in my heart. I've worked hard to shape this with words so people can understand. Hmm. And the resulting poem is called The Church Ride. Not one word has changed from the time that Maddie said that. Um, and he part said it, part acted it out with his Legos, but he was trying to explain to me how we can make choices in life and the difference between joyful laughter and laughter that's not joyful. And um, it was a profound poem, and I said, where did that come from? And he said, well, they're my words, but it's God's message. Hmm. And he was four years old. <laughs> I, want, I want to share a little bit of Maddie with you. This is uh, Maddie Stepanek reading a little poem about what he called heart songs, and his mother can explain what that means in a minute. Here's Maddie Stepanek. I have a song deep in my heart, and only I can hear it. If I close my eyes and sit very still, it is so easy to listen to my song. When my eyes are open and I am so busy and moving and busy, if I take time and listen very hard, I can still hear my heart song. It makes me feel happy, happier than ever, happier than everywhere and everything and everyone in the whole wide world. Happy like thinking about going to heaven when I die. My heart song sounds like this. I love you, I love you. How happy you can be. How happy you can make this whole world be. And sometimes it's other tunes and words too. But it always sings the same special feeling to me. It makes me think of Jamie and Katie and Stevie and other wonderful things. This is my special song. But do you know what? All people have a special song inside their hearts. Everyone in the whole wide world has a special heart song. If you believe in magical, musical hearts, and if you believe you can be happy, then you too will hear your song. I love that. What do you think watching that? It's so nice to see him, hear him. I read his poetry frequently, but to hear his voice and see his face, uh, just a gift. Um, I love it. And I remember when he actually wrote that exact poem, 
um, and coined the word for himself, though I'm sure other people have used the word heart song. Mm -hmm. But uh, when he was young, Maddie wrote two different types of poetry, you know, poetry that you hang on your refrigerator, right. you know, just kid poetry. Right. And these messages that he said God was placing in his heart and asking him to choose the words to shape the message. Mm -hmm. And when he was five, he had written a poem uh, the night before where he said, this is the first time I've ever done this. I combined what I want to say with what God wants me to say. And I shaped the two of them together. So this is my message with God's message. Mm. And as he leaned across the kitchen table to share this with me, a little music maker went off in a sweatshirt he was wearing and started playing a song. And he goes, this is my heart song. Oh. And it stuck. And uh, so he called his expression his heart song. Mm. That's, a, that's a pretty profound insight, though, for a child to recognize and say, this isn't God's message. Mm -hmm. But this is my words trying to shape and communicate this message that I'm getting from God. I mean, that's a pretty profound theological concept. <laughs> I mean, I didn't understand it, Raymond. I really, mm -hmm. um, when he first started saying that God spoke to him, he was three and four years old. And I believed that he believed it. I did not understand it. Um, it really took me his entire life to begin understanding that he really was hearing God in his heart. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he, yes, I, I still grapple with that. I'm still in awe mm -hmm. of my son's relationship with God. I want to share an email from you. This is with you. This is from Mary Ann. It says, I still pray for Maddie, one of only a handful of people I mention by name when I speak with God. I know that those prayers helped the wonderful children when he was still alive and with us. And they are still helping his mother and others who love him. Mary Ann. And Maddie was a big prayer. He oh, yes. prayed often. Yes, he prayed How very often. How often did he pray? Oh, he prayed uh, more than daily. Uh, prayer was a part of our morning together. We prayed together every evening and every morning. He prayed throughout the day. Um, he always prayed, not just when he needed something. He talked to God in the most joyful times. And uh, prayer was almost like just an ongoing conversation. Mm -hmm. He just always, God was there and he spoke with God. Um, mm -hmm. in an intimate way mm -hmm. throughout every day. And in the midst of all of this, in the midst of his getting these messages, writing them down, mm -hmm. speaking publicly, battling this horrible disease, and we'll talk about the toll it was soon to take on him, um, he is also an average boy. Absolutely. As I read this, <laughs> as I read the story, as I watch some of the videos, yes. you know, he... He reminds me of my, my, son, my middle son, Lorenzo, where they can be very solemn and they, they're great in front of people. Mm -hmm. And then they turn around, they're, you know, they tell a fart joke. I mean, that's, and that's Maddie. That's <laughs> Maddie. He was as witty as he was wise. And in one five-minute period, he could pen a poem that would lift your heart and, mm -hmm. and open your mind and also tell some horrendous joke or plan some horrible practical joke mm -hmm. on a poor, unsuspecting doctor. I mean, this was a boy who loved movies. Mm -hmm. He loved uh, Shrek. He loved The Lord of the Rings. Uh, yes. And joining us now, who just called in, is Sean Astin, uh, the actor who played Mr. Frodo in the movie. He's also a part of the... Uh, oh, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Sam. I, I have to correct Sam myself. Sam Ganji. I, I'm mm -hmm. confusing my... Tolkien Sam is Wise spinning Gandhi. somewhere. Um, uh, Sean Astin joins us. He's also part of the Truth and Life audio Bible that uh, I just produced uh, this Christmas. Sean, thanks so much for being with us. Tell me, what... what what did you think when you first saw this little boy, when you first heard Maddie's message? Uh, first, hi, Jenny. Hi, hi, Sean. How are you, my son? <laughs> um, I have, Jenny, Jenny's one of my moms. I, I, I guess I'm one of her sons. But the, wow. um, what did I think? Well, the, my first, my, the first thing I knew was um, my, my best childhood friend, Chris Bidell, was in the hotel with me. We were promoting Lord of the Rings. And, you know, it was uh, just a full-on experience of... of talk shows and award shows and just every other kind of media you could imagine. And, and uh, it was just kind of all bl blended together. And then we got this call saying that there was an award that I think Maddie was supposed to present at, right? Or was he being presented to? Maddie was receiving the award, but was too ill to get to New York to, to receive the award. Right. And so I was asked to, I guess, Accept it on his behalf. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, and I was, I, I don't think I, I knew who Maddie was at that point, but my friend, who was sort of an unflappable guy, when the, when the, the word came through from the publicist, hey, would you be willing to do this for this, this kid, Maddie Stepanek, 
his eyes open up. He's like, you have no idea. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, you have no idea. You have no idea. His mom, who's a wonderful woman, Samantha uh, Faulkner, he, uh, she said, you, he said, you have to call my mom. You have to talk to my mom. I was like, oh, it was kind of strange. And so I picked up the phone and, and called Sam, and she she just said, you have no idea the, what, what you're about to experience. This little boy is basically God is speaking through this child to millions of people, and he, he moves people, and you have no idea. They just kept saying you have no idea. So by the time I, I actually spoke, I think the first time I spoke to Matthew was, to Maddie was, um, I guess I was in the New York Public Library, like just about to go on in, in, in front of this thing and accept his award for him. And uh, I don't know, it was like I was talking to my little brother. He just seemed like a cool little kid, you know? <laughs> that, that is the case. But what I remember, Sean, is you and Maddie got very close in the year and a half that you knew him. But I remember you promising that you'd meet him in person. And when his heart stopped and he slipped into a coma, I remember you racing to the hospital and kissing him and saying, take pictures of me kissing him because if he wakes up, I want him to know I followed through. I met him. I came here. And you told him you would be a part of making sure his message went into the future. And he did come out of that coma briefly. Mm -hmm. And when I showed him the pictures, he said, oh, wow. Sean Ashton really came and kissed me. Uh, and Sean has been a part of taking Maddie's message, um, God's message, mm -hmm. into the future. Sean, thank you so much for calling in and for all you do and uh, for being a part of this great story. Well, Jenny, you, uh, you're an amazing human being, and, and I think anyone who knows anything about children, I have three kids now myself, Raymond, uh, knows that n none of us are anything without our parents. Mm -hmm. And Maddie is a, is a gift from God, and you made who he is possible, not just because of his life, his actual physical life, but your philosophy, your life, your intellectual training, all these things that, that it might be easy to overlook are mm -hmm. so, uh, were such an important part of helping him develop his, uh, his mind and his voice as, a, as an artist and as a poet. So I, I just always feel like, you know, wh where, would, where would Jesus be without Mary? You know, that's what I feel like when I think about Jenny yeah. Stepanek. Yeah. No. Thank you, Sean. No, thank you, Sean. And, and Jenny, uh, Sean touched on it, and it's so true. Um, you see the echo after knowing you a little bit. Uh, you can feel your imprint and your echo in Maddie's work. Mm -hmm. um, how, in what way? I mean, you all spent so much time yes. together. And this is the, the beauty of the story. I mean, he had such a short life, 13 years. Um, but you were with him through so much of that time. You probably spent more time with him than many parents who have 30, 40, 50 years with their yes. kids because of your conditions. Right. Um, I actually worked hard to spend time away from him so that he would have a normal mm -hmm. experience of not having mommy in the movie theater with him, mm -hmm. not having mommy by his bedside, and yet recognizing that he needed somebody constantly and towards the end that he wanted me to be there when he died. Mm -hmm. So there was that constant vigilance um, during the, the end of his life. Um, and yes, we were very close. Being close can also make you disagree on things. We didn't always see eye to eye. Um, there were disagreements and arguments sometimes. Um, <laughs> but very respectable. About what? Um, oh, usually it was uh, about procrastinating some medical procedure. <laughs> he was great at coming up with excuses to put off Broviac dressing change, which he just mm -hmm. hated. And he was very clever at trying to bargain to get out of uh, trigonometry and <laughs> subjects that he didn't think were necessary to a peacemaker. Uh, mm. But you know what? I'm the mom. It's the rule. It's the law. Do your school work, son. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about the illness. And, and again, this is a very, it was a very progressive form of muscular dystrophy yes. um, that basically deprived him of oxygen. It's a very deceptive condition, dysautonomic mitochondrial myopathy. Which you suffer now, from and are suffering from right, right now. Now I have it. I had four children in four and a half years being an Irish Catholic. Did not know I carried this disease. Did not know I was giving this disease to my children. We did know something was wrong, but with the misdiagnosis came a misprognosis of recurrence. By the time we found out what this disease was, I was the first one diagnosed. Mm. Um, two had died. Third one and the fourth one, Jamie and Maddie, were not doing well. What it means for my children um, was that anything automatic, autonomic, breathing, heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature, 
these things were not reliable. Sometimes they worked, sometimes they didn't. One of the most devastating things is that with this disease, my children looked pink. Mm. You would think they were getting enough oxygen. The problem was even though they looked pink, they were not using the oxygen. So they felt like they were suffocating. Their bodies acted like they were suffocating. Um, so you had to flood them with oxygen to trick this disease, but eventually you run out of oxygen to flood them with. Mm. You run out of tricks. Um, mm. And it's a horrible, I, I, I don't think I've ever, I know people have suffered worse than Maddie. Mm -hmm. I have never seen such suffering as what my son went through the last couple of months of his life awake, um, not able to take pain medicine. Um, I have never seen such suffering and I've never seen simultaneously such grace and such a focus on other people in the midst of his own suffering. Yeah, and I, I want to talk about that in our next segment, Jenny, but t for a moment, tell me about how when you read these poems from such a young boy, mm -hmm. I mean, you read the poems he wrote at eight, nine, ten, mm -hmm. this sense, this eternal perspective mm -hmm. that he had, do you think it was living on that border between life and death that informed that, thrust it upon him, that eternal perspective? Because he could have just as easily lived in delusion. Absolutely. Um, but he didn't. He didn't. And, and, you know, I really won't ever fully know the answer. My guess is um, he was a very bright child, very articulate, mm -hmm. loved words. And, um, and there was something spiritual. He did live kind of caught between living a life of spirituality and a life of mortality. Mm -hmm. It's like some of us, our spirituality and mortality, they're parallel, they're, they're best, at best touching, and his were so connected. Mm -hmm. And perhaps it was always having to wake up, thanking God, I woke up. I mean, every morning, the first thing he'd say is, I woke up. Mm -hmm. Thank you, God. And you Thank see that in the God. poetry, that the um, gratitude um, the, and the understand. you know, and it's not always this general kind of thing. It was very specific. I mean, he was a Catholic. Mm -hmm. He, he, he uh, was, uh, read the Liturgy of the Word at Mass. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, taught I CCD. Yeah, taught CCD, which we'll mm -hmm. talk about in a minute. I want to show people this little poem as a way to sort of get into this segment and talk okay. about his faith. Uh, this is a poem he wrote called Eternal Roll Call. Listen to this. Eternal Roll Call. I will paint rainbows when the spring comes and the children will dance and smile in the music of my colors. I will shape clouds when the summer comes, and children will chant and dream in the melody of my creations. I will whistle winds when the fall comes, and children will listen and hum in the understanding of leaves. I will jingle stars when the winter comes, and the children will laugh and believe in the ballads of the season. I will revolve seasonally when my death comes, and children will remember and share their heart songs, celebrating the gifts in the circle of life. Wow. <laughs> no, you hear that, and you're just, I mean, it's, it's so wise, but it breaks your heart. It does. It does. That's one, many of his poems I can look at and say, oh, I know why he wrote that. I know where he wrote that. I know when he wrote that. Um, that's one that I hadn't seen until he said, this is one that I want to go in, you know, whatever was the upcoming book. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of those that kind of took my breath away when my... Um, 10 or 11 year old son shared it with me hmm. and I had not seen it before. Yeah. I want you to talk about in 1998 Cardinal Hickey, yes. James Hickey the former Archbishop of Washington meets with Maddie at your parish church. Mm -hmm. Now Maddie at that point had just made his first communion mm -hmm. a few weeks before right. and the Cardinal is about to confirm some kids in yes. the parish. What happens there? And it, it really, to me, it's a real validation of what he'd been telling you all along. Yes. Um, well, I was singing in the choir. Maddie was sitting near me. 
And every time Cardinal Hickey would ask a question of the confirmande, Maddie's hand would shoot up in the air. And he was so excited, wiggling, 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 um, just waving his hand in the air. And I kept saying, Maddie, put your hand down. Maddie, put your hand down. Finally, I whispered, this is not your confirmation. Put your hand down. <laughs> so when the confirmation mass was over, everybody goes off and they're eating cake and cookies and punch and Maddie's wandering around congratulating people. And unbeknownst to me, Cardinal Hickey approached him and asked him, um, you know, your hand was up in the air mm -hmm. very often. Did you have a question? I, I can answer anything you want. And Maddie said, oh, no, sir, I had the answers I wanted to share. <laughs> so Cardinal Hickey chatted with him a bit about the answers and then talked to our pastor, uh, Father Isidore Dixon, and, and said, this child is ready to be confirmed. And when you have a life-threatening condition, there can be an exception on the timing. Um, and they both approached me and asked if I would allow them to confirm Maddie right then and there. And I said no. Um, I said no because he had just received his first communion. He's seven years old. And my hope was that he would live long enough to be confirmed mm -hmm. as a teenager. But part of me was afraid that might not happen. And I said, I, I want my son to not be confirmed because he knows the answers. Mm -hmm. I want him to receive this sacrament because it is his choice and he has considered what he's doing. Mm -hmm. um, so Cardinal Hickey said, well, what if we work with him for a year? And if in a year he wants to be confirmed, is that okay with you? And I said, absolutely. And that's when Cardinal Hickey said, um, you do recognize who your son is, what your son is. And I said, no. When I'm thinking, did he like dip his finger in the cake? And eat? I mean, I'm, I don't know what this is leading up to. And he said, your son is a messenger. And I apologized because Maddie had said from the time he was three and four years old, God puts messages in my heart, so I'm a messenger. That's my role. That's my reason for being. And I told Maddie he could be a messenger quietly at home, but that's not something we tell other people. You, you're <laughs> not, that's not how to get friends, is to say, I'm God's messenger. Um, mm -hmm. Because he was an ordinary kid who mm -hmm. believed God spoke to him. And I remember Cardinal Hickey saying, um, I apologized. And I said, I'm sorry, I've asked him not to say that to people. I apologize. Mm -hmm. And he said, your son didn't say it. I recognize it. Um, and it mm. just, in that moment, I was in that same awe as when Maddie was three years old and started saying these things. Do you believe he was receiving messages from God? I first started realizing and thinking how real this might be when Maddie was 13. Um, since Maddie's death, I can no longer deny that these were simply good thoughts that my son attributed to, mm -hmm. to God. There are so many, I, I hear from thousands of people around the world who say Maddie's a catalyst for change in their life, that there's something about his face, his voice, his words, mm -hmm. there's something about him. Um, so I absolutely, and I hope that doesn't sound anything other than the humble way I'm saying mm -hmm. it, but... Yeah. I want to go to a caller. This is Marie from California. Very quickly, Marie, you had a comment. I do. I was introduced to Maddie a, a long time ago through his heart song books, and and I uh, introduced Maddie to my son Samuel, and and Samuel wrote Maddie a letter and said, "Wow, you are something." And and from that time, I'm a counselor in an elementary school, and I use Maddie's uh, material, his books with um, all of my children in the, in the elementary school. I just love your son, and I love his message to the world, and I'm just so happy to be able to share him. This January, we're going to have what is called the Peacemakers Week, celebrating Martin Luther King, but we're also going to be celebrating Maddie. And I just want to wow. thank you for bringing him into the world. He's just been a real inspiration to us. Thank you, Marie. That was beautiful. Thank you. I hear from many teachers. Um, I heard from one today who said, can you come in next week? So I'm going to a school next week because it happens mm. to be local. Oh. That's wonderful. We, we are going to take a quick break. When we return, the miracle Maddie Stepanek experienced, how his meeting with Oprah Winfrey changed her career. And Jenny will take your calls about finding your reason for being through suffering and loss. When the World Over Live continues, as we go to a break, here's Maddie Stepanek reading his poem, December Prayer. Take a look. December prayer. No matter who you are, say a prayer this season. 
No matter what your faith, say a prayer this season. No matter how you celebrate, say a prayer this season. There are so many ways to celebrate faiths. There are so many faiths to celebrate life. No matter who, no matter what, no matter how, you pray. Let's say a prayer this season together for peace. life philosophies every day. One is my life philosophy, to remember to play after every storm. Every life storm in our lives is like a challenge on this road, but with the MDA bulldozer and torch running, I'll just plow right over that. The second one is to re- is my mom's life philosophy, to celebrate life every day in some way. And not only while we are plowing over those challenges with our torches, we'll wave those torches around, sing some songs, celebrate life while we are beating the odds. And finally, my hero, Jimmy Carter's life philosophy. If you want something bad enough, never give up trying for it, and you will succeed. And if we don't give up the hope, and we keep playing after every storm, and we keep playing. Mm. That's Stepanek. Uh, laying out his philosophy, I'm joined by his mother, Jenny Stepanek, who is the author of the new book, Messenger, The Legacy of Matty J.T. Stepanek and Heart Songs. It's a great book. It's available everywhere, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You can get it wherever books are sold. Um, Matty, he looks great there, but he had a lot of ups and downs. In March of 2001. Mm -hmm. He goes in, he's having some breathing problems. His trachea is essentially pulp. Yes. Jenny, quickly tell us, what was the condition? And he must have been terrified at that point. He was terrified. Um, He, from a lack of oxygen, his skin was eroding. Basically, his body was dying around his spirit. Uh, He slipped into a coma on March 30th, 2001. He came out of the coma. No one thought he was going to survive that day. Mm. Somehow he did. There was worldwide prayer. Uh, Mother Teresa even prayed for him, um, Mm. which was beautiful. Um, He came out of the coma and pretty much woke up to find out that he was going to die, that there was nothing left of his trachea, that it was completely eroded, and that eventually it would just break through and he would suffocate and agonize for the last 20 minutes of his life. He sat in the hospital for several months, kind of waiting for this to happen, and then made the decision that with bloody fingers, bloody lips, blood pouring out of his trachea, he wanted to go home and live until death occurred rather than spend the time in the hospital Mm -hmm. dying. Um, A friend of ours, a friend of a friend, had loaned him a, at the time, blessed brother Andre Relic. Mm. Now a saint. Now saint um, Andre Bisset. Um, Very... That's wonderful. Um, and on the day before Maddie was going to leave the hospital, which basically they were sending him home in an ambulance, they weren't sure he would survive the trip home. Maddie picked up this relic, said something to the effect of, Blessed Brother Andre, you need a miracle to become a saint, to be recognized for generations mm-hmm. to come. I need a miracle to finish what God wants me to do here on earth. Let's work together. And he touched the relic to his trachea and the bleeding stopped. The doctors assumed it was a scab forming, which meant that's it, He's get him home quickly. They actually bumped up his discharge. He was gonna go home on Wednesday. Mm. They sent him home on Monday, just, it's time to go, time to go or you're not gonna make it home. That's when Maddie's mission began. That's, mm. it was during that, the next two to three years that Maddie did everything that he wanted to do um, and then died. And he, he showed up on Oprah, spread his message of peace, Absolutely. wrote his poems, gave speeches all them. over the United States, had mm-hmm. five books published, two that were almost finished written before he died. Mm-hmm. Um, he came so close to finishing. And the beautiful thing is that 
because he had that extra time, he was able to plant so many seeds. And now the legacy, what, what's happening around the world because of what he started, um, that had a chance to take root and begin growing. What, what did you learn from this about the, the reason for being, his reason for being? I mean, as I read this story, I thought, here was a child, and because of the circumstances, he was sort of forced to focus on what am I here for? What is my mission? And I think many of us run through our lives and never consider that because we think this is an endless ride. Right. But it isn't. No, it's there, not. There, I mean, there's a definite end for all of for us. For all of us, absolutely. Um, well, I mean, I've always believed everybody has a reason for being, mm -hmm. and we don't always know what that reason is. But God does, mm -hmm. and that's what matters most. And sometimes an individual, like my first three children, had no clue what their reason for being was. Mm -hmm. That fell to Maddie, to me, to find reason. What I do know, and I learned this recently, this is not something that Maddie said, I learned it in a Bible study, that if we live our life, and this is what Maddie did, but not under these words, if we live our life making God's concerns, our concerns, mm -hmm. then we shift the focus from our own pain to God's love for all of us. Mm -hmm. And then it's so much easier to realize our reason for being and for bringing joy to somebody else. I want to show this bite. This is from Oprah Winfrey, who met Maddie. Here's how he changed her life. This is a little interview with Barbara Walters from just this past week. Take a look. When I was trying to decide around the 20th year, you know, whether to continue or not, I got an email from Maddie saying, I'm not feeling that 20 is the year for you. Yeah. <laughs> really. I think you should you should work it out until 25. Huh. And um, actually, that, that that had a great deal of influence yeah. on me because he's just he's just pure. Maddie yeah. was was just a pure soul. He was a pure soul. Hmm. Yes, I remember that. And I because he told me he was going to write this email. Mm -hmm. I said, you can't do that. You cannot tell Oprah Winfrey what to do. And he said, oh. We're friends, she'll understand, and there's a reason she has to go to 25, not 20. Oh. And he said, you use, he said, for 20 years, you've given gifts to people. Take those five years and teach people to be the source of those gifts. Hmm. He said, teach them to be you, to, to be the, their best selves. Hmm. Um, and that's, she's done a lot of that in the last five years. Amazing. Well, I hope she has you back on before uh, she winds up her... Her, uh, her tenure here. Uh, let's talk for a moment about he de develops this terrible hole in the back of his head. Yes. And uh, I, I know I'm kind of conflating things here, but there's a moment in the book where you describe he's in the pediatric care unit, mm -hmm. intensive care unit. Mm -hmm. And he, this child, his trachea is decomposing. And he's praying for children in the adjoining areas. Yes. He wrote poetry for other families who were watching their children die. He wrote poetry for the doctors and nurses. Um, absolutely. A, a few days before he died, this is a child whose body, bones were broken all over his body. It was so twisted and mangled because of this disease. And he was dripping in sweat and in excruciating pain. He was gasping for every breath. And a baby in the next bed started crying. And he took every bit of strength he had to keep yelling out, nurse, nurse, nurse. And the nurse came running to him to say, what's wrong, what's wrong? And he said, comfort the baby, love the baby, sing to the baby. Mm. And that was his concern, was to love someone else in his own suffering. Mm. Um, which just, that brought me to tears. Mm. Uh, I heard the baby crying too, and I'm worried about my baby. Yeah. <laughs> and he's worried about All these other God's people children. Around him. Mm. Yes. Uh, we have a call. Susan from Pennsylvania. What's your question, Susan? My question is, uh, first of all, I would like to commend Marty's mom, or Maddie's mom, actually, mm -hmm. for her strong faith. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do not have that strong faith that she has. Um, our system, our health care system had failed my son. They uh, killed him because he didn't have insurance, and he died of MRSA. How do you get your faith, and how do you believe in God, a God that takes your children away, and the law is not helping you? First, I have to say I hear your pain, and I am so sorry, and I will pray for you and for your family. Um, I can say that my strength comes from the very firm belief 
that God did not take my children, that God cried with me as my children transitioned from earth to heaven, that God is with us even in the worst suffering. God doesn't choose who to give things to. Um, and I can tell you that faith is hard work. Faith is a choice. I have to think every morning, why am I going to bother getting out of bed? It is physically painful. It is exhausting. And I know I'm going to spend another day with all four of my children dead and buried in a cemetery a half an hour away. Hmm. And yet if I can shift from focusing on my pain and my misery to how I might be a witness to God in the world during that day, during this day, somehow that, that makes me be able to get through this moment and then the next moment and then the next moment. It doesn't take away the pain that you have felt or that so many other people have felt, but it, God's with us in the pain. He doesn't give us pain. He walks with us through the pain. Hmm. Here's a message from Harold. He writes this, Dear Jenny, I'm, a, I'm 33 years old. I have another form of muscular dystrophy and re require the use of a wheelchair and a ventilator. I had the blessing to meet Maddie and his mom when he received an award from, for the, at the National Shrine. At the time, I did not have a ventilator. A few years after his funeral, which I also attended, I started having difficulty breathing and required an emergency tracheotomy. When I stopped reading, then, uh, when I stopped reading altogether, thinking about Maddie helped me to get through that ordeal. Maddie inspires me to do what I have to do before leaving this earth with determination and courage. Wow, that's beautiful. God bless beautiful. Harold. That's why. And Harold actually echoes my sentiment. Since I started using a ventilator three years ago, you know, after Maddie died, mm -hmm. I have a whole new perspective of what my son went through and yet still chose to focus on other people and to believe that hope is real because it begins with an attitude. Mm -hmm. Not an easy attitude. No. <laughs> um, but an attitude that we can choose. Jenny, I, I want to close with this one little uh, poem, and it's mm -hmm. called Resolution Invocation. Let this truly be the celebration of a new year. Let us remember the past, yet not dwell in it. Let us fully use the present, yet not waste it. Let us live for the future, yet not count on it. Jenny Stepanek, I thank you so much for being with us, thank for you your me. witness, your, your wonderful uh, carrying on of Maddie's message. And I uh, hope you'll come back. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you. For more on Maddie Stepanek and his amazing life, as well as information on the Maddie Stepanek King Farm Foundation, visit MaddieOnline.com, and you can find Jenny Stepanek's book, Messenger, The Legacy of Maddie J.T. Stepanek and Heart Songs at Bookstores Everywhere. We thank you for joining us tonight. Last week, I announced a new contest. We gave away five copies of the best-selling Truth in Life dramatized audio Bible that I co-produced. It's the only Catholic dramatized Bible on the market, voiced by renowned actors like Sean Astin, who you heard earlier, and Michael York, Blair Underwood. I asked the question, what role did I perform in the Truth in Life audio Bible? Now, many of you said producer. Well... I told you that in the intro. The answer was St. Thomas the Apostle. I voiced the role of St. Thomas. Now, the first five of you who answered correctly, we've already notified you. You'll get your own copy. Tonight, I'm renewing the contest, okay, in time for Christmas. We're going to give away five more copies. Here's the question. Who gave the Truth and Life audio Bible his imprimatur? Who gave the audio Bible his imprimatur? The first five correct answers sent to Raymond at RaymondArroyo.com will win a copy of the audio Bible. You can order your own copy by going to RaymondArroyo.com, clicking on the banner up top. That will take you to EWTN's religious catalog. Well, that is all the time we have. Next week, our big World Over Christmas extravaganza with new performances from Aaron Neville and the priests, as well as a host of Christmas favorites. Don't miss this wonderful show. Until next time, on behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. We'll see you then. Bye now. Thank you again,